Okay, I think we're ready to go. Well, what I'm going to be talking about this evening is dyslipidemia in patients with obesity, and I'm going to focus on triglycerides since that's the major problem. This slide lists the lipid abnormalities that typically occur in patients with obesity. Of course, there's increased triglycerides, but there's also decreased HDL cholesterol levels and decreased ApoA1 levels. There's also an increase in non-HDL cholesterol and ApoB, and the number of LDL particles are increased. While the number, while the levels of LDL cholesterol aren't increased, I think it's very important to recognize that the number of particles are increased. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And the reason for that is the LDL particles tend to be small and dense. So they don't have as much cholesterol, but there's more of them. The HDL is also small and dense. Now, this slide shows the classification of triglyceride levels. I'm sure everyone's familiar with this. I've listed in milligrams per deciliter, as you can see, and also in millimoles per liter, because I know in most countries in the world, uh, people think in millimoles per liter rather than milligrams per deciliter. But you can see the optimal levels, the normal level, borderline high, high, and very, very high. And so these are sort of the parameters we use in deciding the lipid levels. And in the United States, and I'm showing data from the United States here, uh, and I just show this slide to point out that people that are overweight and obese, defined as BMIs between 25 and 30 for overweight and greater than 30 for obese, that a high percentage of them have elevated triglyceride levels. So if you have a clinic where you see a lot of obese people, you're gonna see a lot of elevated triglyceride levels. It's 40% approximately. So it's gonna be just very, very frequent. Now, what determines if the triglycerides are elevated? Well, there's a lot of factors that affect our triglyceride levels. The first thing to think about is genetics. There's a variety of genes that can affect triglyceride levels. There's some genes that are fairly rare, but have large effects. And I've listed some of those variants, lipoprotein lipase, ApoC2, ApoA5. Uh, there's a number of those genes that heterozygotes will have abnormalities in their, lip, in their triglycerides. Of course, homozygotes, these are the people that present with the chylomicronemia syndrome with very high triglycerides. But there are homo heterozygotes that will also have milder abnormalities. Even more important are that there's common polymorphisms that increase triglycerides. And this is a whole variety of different sites on our chromosomes that are associated with high triglyceride levels. And you can actually do calculations where you can get a high genetic score for hypertriglyceridemia. And so there's some patients that are gonna be more susceptible for this. These are the things that we used to call familial hypertriglyceridemia or familial combined hyperlipidemia. These are due to a number of common polymorphisms and you get multiple polymorphisms and you get these high levels. Now that's the genetics, which may play a role. Of course, there's also secondary causes. And that comes into things like diet and obesity, alcohol consumption, diabetes, hypothyroidism. There's a whole long list of secondary causes. Some which are lifestyle, some which are disease, uh, uh, diseases. And those will also affect triglycerides. So it's the combination of these that give you the high triglyceride levels. So not every obese patient is gonna have high triglycerides. It really depends on the background that the obesity occurs in. What are the genetic factors? What are the secondary causes? Now, why does one get hypertriglyceridemia with obesity? Well, let me take you through this slide. If you start in the lower right-hand corner, you see insulin. And the obese patients tend to be insulin resistant. So they don't get as much insulin action on their adipose tissue. They also have more adipose tissue. And that leads to increased free fatty acids. And the free fatty acids go to the liver and increase the free fatty acid store in the liver. Now, there's other things that also can increase the level of free fatty acids in the liver. 
obviously chylomicrons, most of the triglycerides taken up by muscle and adipose tissue, but a fair amount is also delivered to the liver. And so if you have a high fat diet or you're eating a lot of fat, you can deliver more free fatty acids to the liver. And also you can see dietary sugar. Dietary sugar stimulates the novo fatty acid synthesis in the liver. And that of course can increase the free fatty acid levels as well. When you have more free fatty acids, they get converted to triglycerides and the triglycerides allow for the increased secretion of VLDL. So you get increased VLDL and hypertriglyceridemia. So this is the major mechanism, but it's not the only mechanism. The insulin resistance also plays a role in the periphery on regulating lipoprotein lipase. And this enzyme is crucial for allowing for the breakdown, the catabolism of triglyceride rich particles. And that can also be somewhat impaired in patients who are obese. So you get this combination of overproduction and decreased clearance, and together that leads to an increase in triglyceride rich lipoproteins. Now, it turns out that the ability of lipoprotein lipase to catabolize the triglyceride on, on triglyceride rich particles is regulated by a number of factors. There's positive regulators, APOE5, APOC2, APOE. And there's also a series of negative regulators, angiopoietin like protein 3, 4, and APOC3. And the balance of these regulators can influence the ability of lipoprotein lipase to work. And the one that's taking, uh, is getting more and more attention now is APOC3. And this one turns out to be very, very important, particularly because patients who are obese have an increase in APOC3 levels. And this may be secondary to the hypoinsulinemia that occurs in people who are obese. And the insulin, the high insulin levels can stimulate the liver to make more APOC3. As shown on the last slide, APOC3 inhibits lipoprotein lipase activity. And this of course can reduce the clearance of triglyceride rich lipoproteins. But APOC3 has additional actions that are harmful with regards to triglyceride. It also inhibits the hepatic uptake of triglyceride rich lipoproteins. So it's affecting two parts of the clearance of triglyceride rich lipoproteins. In addition, it also promotes hepatic triglyceride synthesis in the formation and secretion of VLDL. So it's playing a role in both the clearance and the production. And it's now been shown that loss of function mutations in APO3 C3 can lead to decreases in triglyceride level and re reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. And pharmaceutical companies are actually making drugs, some that one that's been recently improved, that will block APOC3 and can have benefits on lipid levels. I won't go into that because we just don't have time for that today, but that's one of the areas that people are targeting as an approach to treat hypertriglyceridemia. Now, it gets even more complex. If you look at the right side of the screen, you see the old view of adipose tissue. And that was that it was really an inert storage depot. If you had too many, many fatty acids and glucose, you made fat. And when you were fasted, you broke down the fat and put the fatty acids out to be used as an energy source during fasting. On the right-hand side is now a more modernized view of the role of adipose tissue. And it's really an endocrine organ. It secretes lots of different bioactive hormones. And the one I'm gonna focus on today are the cytokines, because I think that plays an important role in the lipid disorders that one sees. And of course, these secreted cytokines can go to different parts of the body and play a role in, in the functioning of those parts of the body. And this slide I showed you earlier, and I was pointing out the insulin, things like that. And I now want to point out the cytokines. The cytokines like TNF, IL-1, IL-6, they can all stimulate 
glycolysis and adipose tissue. And that's another means to increase the free fatty acid levels. So in addition to being insulin depleted, you also have cytokines increasing free fatty acid release by adipocytes. In addition, over at the liver, you can see that cytokines stimulate de novo fatty acid synthesis and help provide an increase in free fatty acids to stimulate triglyceride production and VLDL secretion. In addition, cytokines inhibit lipoprotein lipase and adipose tissue, and that can affect the clearance of triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. So the cytokines can be contributing on a number of different aspects to increasing the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. Now, how does this hypertriglyceridemia affect other hypoprotein particles? Well, what happens is you get this increase in VLDL, and the increase in VLDL with CETP allows for the transfer of the triglyceride for cholesterol. So if you focus on VLDL and the LDL on the left-hand side of the slide, CETP, cholesterol ester transfer protein, mediates the exchange of cholesterol esters from LDL for triglyceride from VLDL. And what that does is it puts triglyceride in the LDL, but the triglyceride doesn't stay there. It gets metabolized by lipoprotein lipase or hepatic lipase, and then gets made into small dense LDL, which is a more atherogenic particle than the large fluffy LDL. The same thing happens with HDL. The HDL cholesterol goes to the VLDL in exchange for triglyceride. That triglyceride is metabolized. You get small HDL. And ApoA1, which if there can be multiple ApoA1s on an HDL particle. As the particle gets smaller, ApoA1 comes off, gets cleared and metabolized by the liver, by the kidney, excuse me. And that leads to decreased ApoA1 levels and decreased HDL levels. So this hypertriglyceridemia has effects beyond the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. It also affects other lipoproteins. And this slide just gives an illustration of what we were talking about earlier when I pointed out that you end up with small, dense LDL. Now, if you look at the LDL levels, they can be identical, 130. But the number of particles can be very different because of the size of the particles. And you get these small particles, you have increased ApoB levels, more LDL particles, but the same LDL cholesterol levels. So you can get fooled by just looking at LDL cholesterol in this situation when the triglycerides are high. And what you can look at instead is the non-HDL cholesterol. If you look at the bottom of the slide, you'll see that the non-HDL cholesterol levels are very, very different. And that's one of the reasons why it's often recommended in patients with hypertriglyceridemia to look not just at the LDL, but also the non-HDL cholesterol. If you have the finances, you can even go beyond that and measure ApoB B levels, that's possible. Or you can actually measure LDL particle number as well to get a further insights. But in routine practice, probably just looking at the non-HDL cholesterol levels is sufficient and using that to guide your therapy in these patients with hypertriglyceridemia. Now, why, are we, why do we care about hypertriglyceridemia? I mean, what's, what's the big deal? Who cares? Well, it turns out, and this is a meta-analysis of a large number of studies with a large number of individuals, that there's an association between hypertriglyceridemia and cardiovascular disease. And you can see that on average here, there's about a 70% increase in cardiovascular disease. Now, remember this, whenever you do one of these sorts of epidemiological studies, what you're showing is an association. It doesn't necessarily mean cause and effect. This association has been known for a long time, but do those represent cause and effect? Well, nowadays we think they do because one can do Mendelian randomization studies. And this has to do with genes that affect triglyceride levels or LDL levels or HDL levels. And these are 
randomized basically during conception. And so they're not as influenced by uh, factors that can affect things. Like if you just measure LDL uh, triglyceride levels, you can get fooled because you have low HDL cholesterol levels, you have other factors that could be increasing atherosclerosis. But with Mendelian randomization, you don't have these confounding factors. And so if you look at this slide, what you can see is that when they do genome-wide SNPs, you can see that things that cause high triglycerides do have an increase of heart disease. LDL cholesterol, of course, has an increased risk of coronary heart disease looking at the genetics. Turns out HDL doesn't. And this was a big shock to everyone that HDL didn't seem to actually be related causally to an increased risk of coronary heart disease. Now, to go a little bit beyond this, this is a study that was done by Brian Frentz, uh, published just a year or two ago. And what he did was genetic scores, looking at lipoprotein lipase activity. And you can see that if you have certain lipoprotein lipase polymorphisms, you can get a decrease in triglycerides. And the decrease is fairly large, 70 milligrams per deciliter. And that is associated with quite a bit of reduction in coronary heart disease. You can see coronary heart disease is reduced by about 23%. The, risk, the odds ratio is 0.77. Now, he did the same thing with the LDL receptor polymorphisms, and you can see that the LDL polymorphisms don't decrease triglycerides. What they do, of course, is decrease LDL cholesterol. And you can see that for the decrease in LDL cholesterol of 14 milligrams per deciliter, you get an odds ratio of about the same uh, uh, with coronary heart disease. Uh, so triglycerides play a role, but it takes a bigger reduction. And the key here is actually ApoB, which is shown below on, the, on this graph here, is that the reduction in ApoB for both of these situations, a 10 milligram per deciliter reduction gives the same outcome. But to get that ApoB reduced by 10 milligrams per deciliter takes a much bigger reduction in, LD, in, in triglycerides than LDL. So if you reduce the LDL by 14 milligrams, you get about a 10 milligram reduction in ApoB. But to do the same thing with triglycerides, you need to reduce the triglycerides by about 70 milligrams. And really, basically, it means that you really need to reduce those triglycerides pretty vigorously in order to get a change in ApoB and therefore a change in coronary heart disease risk. Now, how does triglyceride-rich particles cause atherosclerosis? Well, that we don't precisely know, but there's a number of hypotheses. The first thing to point out is it's not probably the large, fluffy triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. It's probably the remnants. So what one has is lipolysis with lipoprotein lipase, and you get smaller remnant triglyceride-rich particles, and they can get in through the endothelium into the into, in, to the intimal space and interact with macrophages. And they're very good at interacting with macrophages, probably better than LDL, and lead to the formation of foam cells. In addition, during this lipolysis, you're releasing saturated fatty acids and other products, oxidized lipids, pro-inflammatory pro uh, compounds. And you can affect inflammation, you can affect coagulation, endothelial dysfunction, oxidative stress. And that can be other factors in addition to the foam cell formation that contributes to the atherosclerosis. Now, coronary heart disease is important, but I just want to put it in one slide to point out that high triglycerides can cause pancreatitis. And it's usually triglycerides that are in the thousands that do it. But if you look at the fasting, tri the non-fasting triglyceride levels, you can see that there's a relationship as your triglycerides go higher and higher, your risk of developing pancreatitis in the future goes higher and higher and higher. And that just simply has to do with if you start off with triglycerides in the three, 400 range, you're more likely under certain circumstances to get your triglycerides into the thousands and get pancreatitis. So that's something to always keep in the back of your mind that there are these other factors that can, besides coronary heart disease, that are important with having elevated triglyceride levels. Now, what about treatment? 
This is a study that, that would compare low fat versus low carbohydrate weight loss diets. So basically it was a ketogenic diet versus uh, on a Dean Ornish type diet where you have very low fats. Uh, and you can see that in this particular study, the weight loss was pretty much equivalent and very, very good. Uh, uh, but there are differences in what happens with regards to the lipid levels. And you can see that a, a low fat diet uh, doesn't lower the triglycerides as well as a low carbohydrate diet because carbohydrates will stimulate fatty acid synthesis in the liver and lead to increased production. So you don't get quite as good a reduction with a low fat diet. You get, you get a reduction because of the weight loss, but it's not as, as robust as what one sees with a low carbohydrate diet. So you'd say, well, the low carbohydrate diet is the ideal way to go. But there's something else to think about because if you look at the LDL, the low fat diet, because you're eating less saturated fat, less cholesterol, is much better at lowering LDL levels. Whereas the low carbohydrate diet, as you can see here, actually didn't lower LDL levels at all. Uh, as far as HDL, the low carbohydrate diet is better at raising HDL levels. Uh, whether that's important for atherosclerosis or not is, is still debatable. So there's different effects of different diets on the lipoproteins uh, when you use them as a weight loss diet. It's, it's not perfectly equivalent. What about exercise? Well, the thing that changes the most with exercise is you get a lowering of the triglyceride levels. And what's interesting about this is that this can occur even in the absence of weight loss. So a patient doesn't have to lose weight with exercise to decrease their triglycerides. And that's because exercise is increasing lipoprotein lipase activity. And that's going to augment the clearance rate of VLDL triglyceride from the plasma. Exercise can increase HDL cholesterol levels, but you got to do fairly extensive physical activity for that. It, it's not just going for a walk once in a while. You got to do a fair amount of exercise to increase HDL. And LDL usually doesn't change very much with exercise unless you get a lot of weight loss. If you get some weight loss, then the LDLs will go down. What about drugs? Well, there's a number of drugs. I think it's important to recognize that in patients with elevated triglyceride levels, statins are effective at lowering triglycerides. So in a patient that has a mixed lipid pro profile, as long as the lipids are and the triglycerides aren't very high, statins are a perfectly reasonable drug. The bioacid sequestrants, you got to be careful of because if the triglycerides are high, they may actually drive the triglycerides higher. Everyone's familiar with fibrates and niacin. These are triglyceride lowering drugs, very effective. Azetamide, similar to the statins, will also lower triglycerides a little bit, as do the PCSK9 inhibitors. The new drug on the block, bempotoic acid, doesn't really change triglycerides. And fish oil at high doses, and this is important, low doses of fish oil that people often use over the counter supplements, one gram a day, do not have much of an effect on triglycerides. But if you get up to three or four grams per day, then they're very effective at lowering triglycerides. Now, one of the controversies in the field, and I wanna just talk about this for a moment, is there's now two trials with omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, One's called to reduce it. And in that trial, they used EPA four grams per day. The other trial is called strength. And this used a combination of EPA plus DHA. And this was in the free fatty acid form, four grams per day. I'm not gonna bore you with the number of patients and the, exactly what they did because it was very, very similar. They were looking at preventing cardiovascular disease. Now, as most of you know, the reducer trial was a very effective. It reduced the risk of major coronary events by 25%. I mean, tremendous effect on cardiovascular disease. Uh, and it was very, very exciting. And everyone was really, you know, strongly thinking about, you know, let's, let's start using more fish oil. Unfortunately, very, very recently, the strength trial was published in JAMA. And as you can see from this slide, there was absolutely no difference in MACE, major coronary, uh, coronary events. Uh, and this was very disturbing. Uh, you know, we had one study using fish oil product, 
that was very, very beneficial. And we have another product that did absolutely nothing. Now, why the difference? And no one really knows, but there's a number of possibilities. And we can start off with maybe EPA has beneficial effects not seen with DHA. Uh, we know that EPA is incorporated into membranes differently than DHA, and perhaps that alters the membrane function in a more favorable fashion, whereas DHA isn't doing that. We also know that EPA is a better antioxidant. It doesn't increase LDL cholesterol levels, where DHA sometimes will increase uh, 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 LDL cholesterol levels. So, you know, maybe these things are different and EPA is just a great product and DHA isn't a great product and adding DHA with EPA makes the EPA not work as well. That's one possibility. The other possibility is to point out that the reduced trial used mineral oil as their placebo, whereas in the strength trial, they used corn oil. And it turned out that the mineral oil may have effects that could be harmful and therefore may not be a good placebo. The LDL was increased in the placebo group in the reducer trial, 84 versus 77. Not a huge increase, but this may have played a role in giving the placebo more car, uh, cardiovascular events, and that could account for the difference. The other thing, the non-HDL cholesterol was increased, and you can see the numbers 130 versus 113. Again, something that could perhaps have played a role in giving the placebo more events. And lastly, the HSCRP was increased because mineral oil was sort of a toxic type of compound and it increased the CRP to 2.8 in the placebo group versus 1.8 in the group treated with the EPA. So maybe the benefits that we're seeing in the reducer trial was simply due to the fact that they used mineral oil as their placebo. And this controversy is, you know, it's difficult to know. I sort of think that there may be something to the EPA. And the reason for that is that there's another trial that wasn't done as well. It was just done in Japan. It was an open label trial. And that's always a problem. It wasn't as, as, as rigid having a placebo. So people knew what group they were in uh, called the JELUS trial. But if you look at this slide, you can see that in the JELUS trial, it was effective at reducing events. And this did not have a mineral oil placebo. And it suggests to me that, you know, makes me lean towards thinking that the reducer trial actually did work. Uh, but this is a controversy you're going to hear more about, and there's obviously going to need to be more data uh, looking at this. And this is the end of my talk, and I just want to show you where I work. This is the San Francisco VA Hospital in San Francisco, and you can see the Golden Gate Bridge in the background. And I'll be very happy to try to answer any questions if there are any. And once again, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about lipids and obesity and try to bring you up to date on some of the information in that area. Thank you.